100 unmarked graves of African Americans on the north end of the cemetery. A lot of people buried here are people who fought the Civil War and escaped from slavery. church has been on this corner since the 1850s. I guarantee people sat in this church, not this building, because this building was built in 1904, but people sat in this church on this corner singing for their freedom. In fact, if you look right here, this says A.D. 1870. It says 1901. That means that this church was built and rebuilt and rebuilt on this spot. This church was founded by a woman named Jessie Stewart, who escaped from slavery in Virginia. She was determined not to be taken alive. She came here, and her husband, Jesse Stewart, who also founded, uh, who was also fought in the Civil War, they had a little um, livery here. A livery is where you keep horses. And we are on what was the southwest corner of Ypsilanti. This is the edge of town. And around this corner then, African Americans started congregating in the 1840s. Jesse and Isis Stewart gave the property for this building. And it was, uh, it was like a bar that they turned into a church. And when they rebuilt the church in 1870, and you can see it right there, 1870, they kept the door frame from the old church. Why? Because that was the door through which people came to freedom. about the Civil War and 1920, all African-American kids have gone to this school until about fourth grade, grade, segregated, desegregated. Hold on, can you raise it up a little bit? What's the difference? Wait, which one is it? Yeah, right. <laughs> Isn't that hard? <laughs> that hard to tell? The difference is under desegregation, the teacher is white. That is the difference. Wow. Ypsilanti had segregated schools until 1978. 1978. You guys would have gone to segregated schools just, you guys still go to segregated schools in some way, but you got to go to officially segregated schools not too long ago. Okay. So we're going to go down to Harriet. Harriet was the old black business district. On Harriet and Monroe Street, there were barber shops, there were clothing stores. There was uh, billiards halls. There was all kinds of stuff down there. There's only one building left, and that's Curry's Barber Shop, and that's the building we're doing the mural on. So I'm, let's go down, and I'll tell you where the, the pool halls were, where the bars were, where Thelma's uh, clothing store was. Hmm? Yeah. yeah, it's right there. That's <laughs>
begin upon the new merger in 1860 something. Oh, I would love to. This building is a uh, very important here in Ypsilanti uh, because it was uh, one of the first buildings that um, African Americans were allowed to meet in. It's a very old building that you can see on our placard outside, 1859. Uh, we're in the process of trying to remodel it, but it takes some time and it takes a lot of money. Uh, there are a lot of churches that started in this building and that now they're all over uh, the city of Michelin. So a lot of history here. Um, anything else you want to add? Um, back in the 1900s, this building was turned north and south. So where you're looking at it now, it was picked up and moved around because Elijah was supposed to be east and west. So that's why it was turned. The master always sits in the east. Once you go upstairs, you'll see that. But this building, actually, the front of it was right here. It was facing this way. So some of our past masters dug it up. And during the, when they was turning it, it took them two years. So they went across the street of Brown Chapel Church in the basement. Which at that time, they were paying rent for like $20 a, a month. Rent back in the 1948 fives. Uh, we say a couple of things about this building. I've been studying this building for a long time, and this is really one of the most historic buildings in Ipswich. The fact that it's been in continuous use by the same group of people for so long is almost unique. And I've been up at, you know, I work for the state, and this building came up a lot. Uh, this building, I mean, if you guys were alive around 1900, there's not a week that would have gone by if you lived in Ipswich that you weren't going to be in this building for some reason. Almost everything, you know, this is the social hall. So. This, this is where you went for band practice. This is where you went for political meetings. This is where you went for, you know, to practice your wedding. This is where you went for choir practice. This is where every, maybe even playing some cards. Basically the stuff you couldn't do in church, you could do here. You know, there were even dances and stuff here. This is the building that the meeting happened in in 1892 uh, that was able to get that officer arrested. I was telling them one of the strengths you could tell of Ypsilanti's black community is, was able to get a white officer arrested in 1892 for the killing of a black man in, um, in custody. Now that doesn't even happen now, but in 1892. And the meeting, what happened right in this building, was called the Indignation Meeting. 300 people packed in this meeting in 1892. That's Black Lives Matter in Ypsilanti in 1892, 120 years before we think about it, and it happened at this building. And there are so many stories connected to this building. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Again, my name is Tyrone Hampton. I do live here in its length, which is the first. But I want to charge you with something because this is history. If you don't know where you're from, you don't know where you're going. You should always know your history. Masonry brings to a common level Men of all castes provides a common language, men of all tongues, unites in a single band of brothers, men of all races. It is across the board and diversified. We have a foundation, faith, hope, and charity, brotherly love, relief, and truth. These distinguish us from all individuals. I don't lie. I want to, but I don't. I don't cheat. I am very patient. Masonry teaches you how to live. Just close your eyes and think way back. 1951. My mother was very fair skinned, equivalent to this lady right here. Very good looking female. She was from Missouri. She was in Chicago and times were very hard. I was born in Chicago, Illinois. She had, a, my brother was two months old. She had to go back home to Mama, which was in Steel, Missouri, which is at the border of Arkansas and Missouri, where uh, I think it's 55. Highway 55 goes right through the
property that my grandfather used to own. She had to go back home. And when she got off the train with her and myself and a newborn, she had to walk through town to go across the railroad track to catch a jitney. Anybody know what a jitney is? A jitney is the transportation system that blacks had to use because there were no cabs. So the, so the black person who owned a car would take people where they had to go for an hour on feet. What happened is when my mother walked through town, there was a group of whites, Caucasians. They were having a few drinks. And they said, there go that Posley girl. We're going to be out to your house later on tonight. Well, in 1951, wasn't a nice place to live. What the Masons did. Didn't know they were Masons, but what they did. Put my mother in the car, put her back on the train, sent her back to Chicago, got her an apartment, got her a job. And now I'm here. There could have been a great possibility that had they made it out there with my mother, she would have been dead. Or we would have been dead. I don't know. But I look at the worst part of it, but that's why I'm a Mason. So if anybody needs any help, I can help. And I want to help. I don't care what it is. Mary McCoy would become one of the most famous black women in the United States, Elijah McCoy's wife. We often don't talk about Elijah McCoy's wife, we talk about Elijah McCoy. But Elijah McCoy's wife was just as important as Elijah McCoy. Her name was Mary McCoy, she was born here in Ann or in Ypsilanti, from an old Ypsilanti family. She was the founder of the Dunbar Hospital, the Phyllis Wheatley Home, all of these homes in Detroit for African Americans, and she was the first vice president, along with um, the wife of Booker T. Washington, of the Women's Clubs, the Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Here is the Starkweather home, and here is the where this house is right here is where the McCoy cabin would have been. They would not have lived in the home. They were employees of the Starkweathers. They were not uh, family of the Starkweathers. But certainly, uh, this is a home where not in this home, but in the cabin associated with the McCoys, uh, people would have hidden out here. This is one of the very, very few places we can say with uncertainty in Ypsilanti, this spot is where people hid.